Welcome back to the Game to Love podcast. On this week's episode, we have Netherlands number one, Robin Haase. He reveals some stories behind some of his biggest matches he's had against Del Potro, Federer, Nadal, Andy Murray, and also talks about the ongoing problem with player promotion in tennis. Make sure, if you've not already, subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. Hey Robin, how are you? I'm good, thank you. And yourself? Yeah, really good. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Uh, yeah, on the podcast. It's, uh, yeah, we really appreciate it. No problem. No problem at all. How's uh, life going for you? Are you in uh, the Netherlands at the moment? Uh, I am. Uh, uh, normally, I, I live in Belgium, but uh, since the outbreak, I, I came back to to family and uh, and my girlfriend in the Netherlands and uh, and therefore I said uh, okay I stay uh, I stay in the Netherlands for a while uh, the borders were closed as well so um, uh, wow. that's why I uh, I stayed yeah. oh, it's such a pleasure to have you on Robin honestly <laughs> you've been a player who we've always spoke about on the podcast for me personally like growing up like you was the guy I, I love watching you play I still do and it's just incredible to have you on this platform. I just can't believe we've got you on. So thank you so much for that. Um, no what we're going to start is obviously there's not been much tennis. You was probably the, one of the last players we saw playing tennis in like Kazakhstan, I believe. Yeah. There was a few players playing in a few tournaments there. Um, since how, how's it been since then? Have you been up to anything at all? Anything new? Um, so what I've done actually when I got back home from uh, Kazakhstan, I, uh, the, um, a lot of people were immediately in, in trouble. Uh, the, the, some people they needed help because uh, the parents were um, uh, working in hospitals and they and they the kids had to stay at home. Um, and uh, so after two days being at home, I, I kind of sent out a message on uh, Instagram that. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm offering my help uh, any way I can. And maybe one of the things I can is do babysitting. Uh, oh, nice. so, uh, so actually, I, I, I did that. I, I did it only twice. It was, it was really great. It was awesome, actually. Um, uh, but what was interesting and what I was hoping for is that people came with other ideas to help. And, uh, and, and, and that happened. So the first three weeks, I was only doing that. And after, after those three weeks, I kind of have to take a step back and, and take some time for myself and, and think, uh, think a little bit what I would do, not only in this period, but also maybe after my career in tennis. Oh, definitely. Oh, well, it's good to hear that you've been keeping yourself busy anyway during this period. Have you had any chance like, uh, to play any tennis at all since uh, you stopped doing the babysitting? Yeah, so um, in the first, I would say, eight to nine weeks, I practiced once. Oh wow! <laughs> uh, so that wasn't much, but I, I felt like it's, you know, normally, well, at least for me, for the past twenty years, I, I always, I always have a goal. Uh, you, you want to play good at that event, or you want to go, you, you go to that next step of your career, uh, and now, kindly, suddenly, it stopped. Mm, and yeah. for, to not have a goal, but then practice hard, it didn't make any sense at all. Uh, because you, we, well, at least I knew it would take a while. So I said from the start, okay, I'll, I'll take this time to do some recovery for the body, uh, take my mind off tennis uh, in a way that, yeah, you don't work, work, work. You just keep on going. And um, um, yeah, and so I, I kept busy, but not so much in tennis. And 
And now the last few weeks, I played around twice a week. Oh, great. And how's that going? You're getting, getting back into it, uh, getting back in the swing? Sorry, the pun. Yeah. <laughs> it must I be easy it. for you, Robin, man. You never lost it. You've always had it. It's yeah, never exactly. going to leave you. You'll be able to play <laughs> for another 10, 15 years. He's going to be there. You can, still, you can play forever. Uh, well, I'm not so sure about that. But last year, <laughs> I, I dropped. I, I, I didn't really have it last year, I have to be honest. Um, but I, I made some mistakes, uh, uh, I think, with uh, my material. Uh, I start changing my material a little bit. And, and even after all these years, you, get, you can get uh, less confidence, you know, when, when you don't play well. And, uh, and from kind of that mistake, one thing led to another. Um, I have, it, it happens, but uh, it's funny that now I haven't played tennis and I went back. I kind of changed my foreign grip a little bit. Uh, um, I mean, that's that's one little, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not that I'm going to change uh, my <laughs> yeah. foreign, but it's one little tweak and, and actually it's going well. And uh, But what can I say? I practiced six times and I'm saying it's going well. It's also a little bit of a <laughs> yeah. crazy thing. <laughs> sometimes yeah. it could be in your head as well if you've just changed something you're always thinking about it but what was the reason for you changing your grip um so what happened a little bit uh, also because of the material i started to play a, a even more topspin on my forehand which i already do but it, it started to go more and more uh or to be more and more um so i, I kind of changed my grip in, in a way and also my back swing in a way that uh, i don't um, play too much spin and, okay. uh, and that in practice, that's going well. Of course, once the matches start, it's, it's always a, a different thing. But one thing that always throughout my career was a constant was my foreign. So I, I, I don't really doubt my foreign. No, we don't doubt it either. I mean, uh, I was just uh, refreshing my memory uh, earlier today on just some of your matches. And I'm literally, I'm stuck for how many highlights. I, I think I could have watched 24 hours of highlights. Literally, that forehand is just like such a piston. If you're improving it, I don't know how. It was literally firing past some of the top players in the world. It's such a great weapon that you've got there. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> what else to say, but uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, what we want to speak about on this episode is something which is we've, we've spoke about low, with, to loads of players now, and it's something that keeps like arising. Um, me and Ben talk about it a lot, but we feel like the skill to get into the top 500, you've got to be an amazing player. To get into the top 100, it is just next level again. Everyone is so brilliant on the tour. But we feel like players, say, even just outside the top 50 or after the top 100, they don't really get the recognition they deserve. And a lot of it is to do with like promotion, the way things are, like the way with challengers and different tournaments. They're played in, during in the mornings. There's not really much for the after, in, the, in the evenings. There's a lack of promotion around these players. And we feel like you, as, as a prime example, you should be getting a lot more recognition, a lot more money than what you have. And there's so many more things that could have been done in the world of tennis. And we've seen now that there's different things where they want to do like an ATP WT merger, whether that's going to change much, whether they're trying to get their help on like a relief fund because we're in a problem uh, situation with the pandemic. But we feel like there should be more done throughout the year anyway. Uh, what's, what's, what's your views on all of this? Um, well, you, you said quite a few things. but uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, sorry about that one. <laughs> no, no, but uh, one, one of the things I, I agree on, I, I, went to, I go to your first point is, is that, uh, and I think it's it's gotten even better and better. Um, so, the, as you said, the number 500 in the world, he can play unbelievable tennis. Uh, so if you go even further, 300, 200, 100, the level is just unbelievable. And at yeah. a certain moment, it's, it's not about the tennis, it's just mentally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so everyone can play. Um, but as you said, the recognition is not there all the time. Um, if you if you compare it with other team sports, which is it's it's tough to compare team sports uh, and and individual ones, but yeah, if you, if you would be um, number yeah now in tennis number three hundred in the world, almost no one knows you. Yeah. But if you're number if you, if there would be a ranking in soccer with uh, to be number and you're like around three hundred in the world, yeah. yeah, you would play at one of the best teams in the world and you would be a a, a star. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. And that's a little bit weird why in tennis it's often um, said that only the top 
five sometimes even matter. It's not even a top yeah. ten anymore. It's yeah, not even sure. the top you know, it's it's just a few people. Um, and I, 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 I don't get that. Um, I, I, I ask myself that question quite a lot, why that is. Um, um, one of the things I know, at least, or what I figured out is, uh, for example, in, uh, in soccer again, in football, is yeah. you love a team and therefore you love the player who's in the team. Yeah. So once that player is maybe not playing that well or goes even out or is done with his career, you still love the team, so you will love the next player. However, in tennis, you either love the player or you don't. Yeah. And, and, and you will see him at a few events, and then you won't see him. Where in soccer, you see that player every single week. Uh, however, in tennis, you might lose first week or first uh, round of the week, and they don't see you anymore. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a different, yeah, very difficult yeah. to... to to give a straight answer, but uh, but why um, or that it uh, that it's a pity that that there's maybe not more recognition for someone that is 300 in the world. Um, yeah, that's yeah. that's. For- I've got, uh, yeah, I just want to add to that a little bit. We spoke to Danilo Petrovic in our last podcast, and uh, he was sort of really vocal about this: the fact that he he said he went to Mexico and they prom- they pushed the challengers back to like an evening slot they advertised it on billboards this was like number 100 versus number one uh, number 200 let's say in the world the stands were all packed and people were actually getting up for these events if due to the promotion of it like if they did this throughout europe and did it everywhere else surely it would be the same result i don't know why they're not doing it yeah and like you said the level of tennis is there the level of tennis is exceptional at this level so you're gonna you're gonna watch it and you're gonna think wow this is amazing it's a case of people don't always necessarily know about it and that's what we really want to try and on this platform maybe if we can do anything or they're working the profile of tennis for other players that would be brilliant uh, well the, the one thing is um it's also a different uh, what what has to do with it is a, the, the different cultures um, if you go to Mexico or South America, the people, they, if you're doing sports, they almost automatically kind of love you. You know, they, 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 they want to cheer for you. If you go a little bit, I would say to Europe, uh, that love kind of changed. Uh, it quickly goes into a love or hate. If you do well, they love you. If you do bad, they hate you. Um, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and in other parts, if you go more to Asia, it, that, that's just more, they, they maybe don't cheer as much, but they respect you a lot. Yeah. So also, it, it also has to do with that and, 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 and to change uh, the way of thinking in a culture, that's going to take a long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. But I think that surely the ATP can start somewhere, uh, like start this change somehow. I don't know like where you start. Maybe because he was saying... Even when you look at that number 25 in the world, he was using an example like Dusan Lajovic. If you say that to someone on the street, people might say, oh, I might know that player, but it's not a household name yet. Like, yeah. the, top, the top 50 should all be household names for sure. The top 100, if anything, should all be as well. But that's what I mean. All those people pushing up into that like, bracket, they should all be getting some sort of promotion in the, in the events where they're playing, I think. Um, I, I think it has gotten better, I have to say, because uh, I've been in the, in the player council uh, uh, twice and once uh, a while ago, a few years ago, and I always pushed for them to not promote only the top guys uh, the, or, yeah, let's say, the top 10. Um, and they, they, they did change that. They came up also with a great idea with the next generation, you know, the next yeah. gen. So they're pushing the next gen. However, those guys that are being uh, helped as the next gen and get a lot of promotion, they're that good that they will get that promotion anyhow. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so it, it is, it's almost difficult. I, I, I don't want to be negative because I really like the, what they're doing, but it kind of now is it's, it's the top guys. It's the next gen, everyone in between. Yeah. We don't really know what to do. Yeah. And they're also trying to push it more. They're trying to help more. They're trying to advertise more. Um, however, it ha- also, I think it has to do with the manpower and the money. Um, you know, like, like you, if you want to make great content, uh, uh, of all these players, 
you need camera people, uh, uh, audio uh, interview journalists to 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 yeah to make it also better. Yeah. And I think one part is the money that that doesn't allow it in tennis as well. Well, yeah, for sure. I think that the well, I don't know the ins and outs of all of the sides of money of, of tennis. With these tournaments, when you have challenger events, when there's pe- there's no one in the stands during like the morning sessions, that type of thing. If you were just to promote it and the money was to go into the tournament, surely the players could get paid better, and there should be it should be able to scale that upwards. Surely, that I, that's in my mind that just makes it's just common sense that if you get bums on seats, you get more money, and the players can have a bit more. Uh, well, they they can build their profiles Just raise the profile of the game yeah i i totally agree with you and 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 i'm going to say something which i always stand for which i always say in the council and even in the in the media i said it before uh the players won't like me as much for it uh but it's a you know like how communication is always two ways and also this is two ways so the tournaments can promote the players but also the players have to be aware of what they can do to promote the tournament and themselves. And most of the times, uh, or not most of the times, but let's say a lot of the times, uh, players are also so busy with themselves, which is normal. I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's a bad thing, but it, uh, because, yeah, you, you, come, you come to do your job and play the best tennis. But besides that, you also have to take the time to maybe do something for the fans to, you know, like golfers, they do this pro-am every single week. So yeah. tennis needs to do that too. But I feel like sometimes we are a little bit too selfish and we want to have more money, but don't want to work more for it. And I don't think that's fair. Hmm. Anyway, yeah. let's talk about you, Robin, because otherwise <laughs> we're going to run out of this podcast <laughs> and we've got so much to talk about with uh, just you. Ben's Literally. got every stat, every match oh, you've ever played I in. Tried. There. I tried my best. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get onto that, something what I want to bring up is you as a player and your style of play. Something what I noticed throughout, throughout you've ever played is you're a showman. When you hit a brilliant point, a big winner, you get the crowd going, you're, in a, you're just a brilliant showman with, with a point. You're always like hands to the sky. And it's just spectacular because you're able to pull off these amazing shots. I wouldn't even be able to get there. So it's amazing okay. that you're able to do that. But how important for you is it when you're playing tennis that you're putting on a show? So one of the things I, I uh, when I started working with my, my, my new coach, and it was uh, around three, four years ago, uh, he asked me, yeah, what, 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 do you, what do you want when you play? And one of the first points in, my, in, in the things I said was to entertain people. Okay. Um, because the people, they pay money. Yeah. Uh, and I and and they want to see good tennis, but they also want to be entertained. They want to see a show, and it doesn't have to be a demonstration. But no. if you if it comes, you know, if it comes from your heart, they will feel it and they will love it. Um, so this is all, always a thing that uh, when I was little and I watched other tennis players, I I was like, oh wow, this is great. I wanna I wanna do this. I wanna see. The, I wanna make other people happy. So how how maybe singers can 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 touch someone with their, with their voice. I kind of have to do it with my record and then maybe <laughs> cheer them up in, in some way. But uh, yeah, um, I guess that's why um, I do these things. And, and, and I think um, uh, people usually like them uh, in my country. So, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's the way it is. Uh, it's, it all comes naturally. And uh, it's just the way I, how I am. And, and, if people don't like it, um, I, yeah, not, nothing much I can do. I, I just want to stay at least be myself on court. Uh, we certainly love it, but I'm sure yeah. the opponent sometimes it must frustrate them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the, it, it, it does happen. And uh, I remember, uh, especially when I was younger growing up on the tour, when I was 18, 19, 20, um, I, 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 I wish I wrote, uh, I would have written it down, but the, the, how many guys broke a record against me? Uh, was kind of funny. Uh, so I <laughs> did something and played play in a certain way they didn't really like. Uh, that sort of ties in nicely to uh, uh, one of the matches that I was watching early. I'm sure you probably know which one I'm going to bring up as well. Uh, Roger Federer obviously be- regained 
number one and became the oldest num- person to get number one against you as well. I didn't only saw this in the, uh, in the comments underneath this video I was watching. I was like, ah, oh, but then you still took the first set off Roger in this match as well. Like I was watching, I was thinking the standard of tennis in this match. And you just feel that everybody knew in the crowd that Federer was going to get that number one spot if, if he won that. And you were just like, like silence in the crowd, so to speak, like with some yeah. incredible tennis. Yeah, that was a special moment uh, to be part of. Um, uh, what a lot of people don't know is that if, if it wouldn't be in my home tournament, if it wouldn't be against Roger <laughs> playing for number one, I would probably not have been going on court, stepping on court. Uh, oh, really? I was, really? I was, yeah, I was sick all week. I had a high fever, um, and uh, I came straight off my bed. I didn't warm up. I just went on court and I started <laughs> playing. And I don't know how I won the first set. Uh, That's remarkable! So, that was yeah, a, it's incredible after, tennis. After that, yeah, but after <laughs> that, I was I was tired. Uh, it didn't. It didn't really pick up on the news, which was good for me. But the, if you look well on the internet, you will find a picture where I'm actually puking inside oh. a inside a garbage can uh, on the court. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, they didn't put that in the highlights. <laughs> well, uh, luckily not. Luckily. Oh not. gosh. Oh, yeah, but that was an incredible, man. It makes it even more incredible now. And now we know this. Uh, there's always these little details that we find out that you don't ever get to hear about. We had Bibian Shubson, who's obviously a female yep. Dutch player. She said when she lost uh, the first set to at least Merton Six Love, nobody knew that she was in the town centre about 30 minutes before the match and had to run two kilometres to get back to the court just to play that match. There's just all these interesting uh, things that nobody knows about like yeah. that goes on in tennis players' lives. There's so many stories before even a match starts sometimes, and I feel like it's important to... It's, it's, it's lovely to hear them because we get, we get that, that side sometimes often from the players, and it just makes the sport even better. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, of course, some things players don't want to say because they don't want to make a, a ten, other player, a tennis player, maybe embarrassed or... Um, uh, you, you, but lots of these stories, uh, uh, at least how I also feel it, if you, if you tell someone these stories now, I can just say it. It was a few years ago. That's how I felt. But if you say it then, they kind of see it as an excuse. Exactly. Yeah. But it, it's not. It's just actually explaining sometimes how you feel, what happened. Um, but often, um, yeah, it's, it, it's, 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 it's nicer to write something different because that sells. Um, so that's why also players, I think, are a little bit hesitant and scared to, to mention all these things. Yeah, and look at another thing, looking at your career, obviously you've played against more or less everyone, <laughs> uh, all the top players. <laughs> but someone I want to just talk about, because for me, like, he's a player I really love watching for his raw power, is Del Potro. And you've played him, I think, a few times now. And um, you've always been quite close matches as well. And th- just looking Very. at the, 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 who's watching the highlights together earlier, it's just ridiculous, the, the level of points. Like, <laughs> he's known for these big, massive, overpowering forehands. <laughs> you just can just smash them back sometimes and just go past him. It was incredible. It's like bouncing yeah. off a wall. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember that uh, uh, I think and uh, those, uh, uh, those uh, few points I think you are also thinking about there in, in, in some highlight reels. And uh, yes, I remember sure. before the match, uh, I, got a, I got a message uh, from Timo de Bakker, a uh, fellow okay. Dutch tennis player yes and then and he said uh, i don't care if you win or lose i just want you to s- at least hit one forehand bigger than del potro and, uh, <laughs> well i got his wish for because i hit one of the fastest forehands uh, ever measured so that was uh that was oh, actually gosh. Nice. and how fast was it just for clarification um it was uh in uh i, I don't i'm not sure in miles but in kilometers okay. uh, per hour it was 181 wow <laughs> <laughs> It's on fire. Speed of sound, wasn't it? I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, it felt like that at that moment. But uh, it got, I won the point, but didn't win the match again. Uh, always came close uh, against him, but never seen. Uh, you had some. You had some epic yeah. battles against him, but yeah. What yeah. was it like playing against him? Um, he's a he's a very, uh, of course, talented player. He's uh, he has this huge forehand where you just don't want to play against. <laughs> 
Um, then his back end, of course, due to his injury, kind of changed over the years. So it is a little bit different to uh, when you played against him. Uh, and, but he's big. He had a massive serve. Um, um, but I, I kind of know what he likes to play. Uh, so the only reason why I think I played good against him because I kind of knew where every shot is coming. Uh, but he's that good that he doesn't care that I know. You know, so okay. he uh, he he just rips forehand after forehand, and all. Even though I know where it's coming, it's sometimes just that big that you just don't. Yeah, you can't react. You just have to kind of hope you can play a good shot back. Yeah, yeah, just stick a racket there and hope a hold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, sometimes that happens with him, kind of. Yeah, you, you feel it. You feel his power. Yeah, I've seen you play so like such a versatile player though that you are i was looking down your record and i think you're one of the first people that we've had on the podcast that's just as good on grass as they are on uh, the other surfaces as well and obviously being british we love wimbledon and we love the grass court tournaments sin you've uh, had some great results on grass one that obviously stands out there was uh, in Halle when you were you beat, I think you beat Dominic Team uh, in that tournament and then came up against Gasquet with this trick shot, which I'm sure has gone down in history, which uh, have you got any, I don't know, can you tell us about this shot? Was this something that you practiced or was this just um, in the moment? No, this, this shot uh, started, actually, started when I was playing Futures. Um, uh, it happened, uh, uh, one of the first Futures I played in Canada uh, I played against Michael Russell, uh, okay. uh, or sorry, uh, no, sorry, that was the challenger where it happened. So at, at first it happened in the Futures, I uh, played a bunch of Futures in Montreal, and there it happened once or twice uh, in a match. And, uh, and it was funny because the, the guys who, were, who saw that, they were, the next day I saw them practic practicing that shot. Uh, <laughs> they couldn't nice. believe what happened. And then I, I played against Michael Russell in a challenger. And, um, and from there, I just, once in a while, I played it. Um, uh, it never really got picked up until I played it against, uh, against uh, Gasquet and Halle. But before, I, I played it against Seppi, uh, against Nadal even. Wow. Uh, I remember <laughs> uh, the one against Nadal, I remember especially, uh, especially because... Once I hit that shot, I was like, I really hope I'm going to win this game. Because <laughs> I saw and and well, he has this bull sign, of course. Well, he turned into a bull and he just wanted to win every single point after that. <laughs> Not the sort of person with Rafa. <laughs> you don't want to be trying <laughs> things like this with Rafa. <laughs> that, you know, that's fine. And, and we know each other. And I even did it once to him in practice. And even in practice, he, he just destroyed me after that. And, uh, you gotta love him for that. But uh, no, it's a. I uh, you know even after uh, at least after my career, I, I maybe I, I never reached a, a second round of a Grand Slam. I I, I never broke into the top thirty. Uh, however, I did invent a new tennis shot, so uh, that's quite quite nice. Wow, <laughs> you still got so close to the top. The number what was it? Thirty three in the world, which is crazy high. Like I was looking back down, like through some of your uh, matches. Obviously, uh, it took me a while. There was like so many like great matches. I looked on there's one of the most interesting things I found that you've been to five sets twenty three times, which is <laughs> quite an incredible thing to have in your career to go to this many five setters. And I just wanted to just uh, speak about a couple of them, or what two or three of them, if that's possible. Uh, there's one that obviously comes up probably more than any of them, which was your match against Andy Murray, which was back in 2011 at that uh, US Open, which, uh, yeah, I'm sorry to bring it up. I know that you were two sets up and then he came back and won, but what a match that one was. I mean, it was just like an epic. And you even at the end, like you got as many accolades as he did that day, I think. Yeah, that was, uh, that was an interesting uh, match as well. And, uh, well, I told you the story about uh, Federer and how I was sick. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, this is also actually a story that had uh, uh, a, a lot of, uh, uh, how you say, um, 
a lot of history before that match. Yeah. Um, because what happened is actually uh, uh, I played the US Open. I, I remember I had to play Rui Machado in the first round, and he was yeah. really a clay court specialist, and he didn't like the fast hard courts of the US Open. Um, but what happened is I had um, a nerve in my lower back, which was uh, kind of pinched. So uh-huh. I really, I couldn't really move that well. So on the day that I had to play Rui Machado, I, uh, I, I warmed up before the match and I, I said to my coach, I can't play. I'm gonna, we have to go to, to the referee and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, yeah, I'm not gonna play. Yeah. And 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 I oh, I said that during the warm up and uh, but I was warming up with uh, Benjamin Becker and and I told him listen can I stand at the net because I can't move and I just I don't want you not to warm up so let me just play and then you can hit some shots and he said sure but because I'm at the net and I'm I'm kind of just reacting um, I make a bad move but that bad move helped my lower back. So I'm like to my coach, maybe I should just give it a try. You know, I mean, it's first round. I have a good draw. Let's, 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 let's do it. And he said, sure, let's do it. And all I remember is I was serving and I was not moving at all in his return games. Uh, but he got nervous at four all every single set. And it, so I won three times, six, four. Yep. Then the next day I had, no problems at all. I'm playing doubles and no problem. I'm feeling fresh and I'm looking forward to the, to my match uh, against Andy. Um, what happens at two o'clock in the night, I wake up and I can't move. So I, I had so much pain that from two o'clock in the morning until six o'clock in the morning, I tried to, to walk down the corridor of my hotel just to keep on moving. And, uh, and then again, I thought, okay, why am I going? Why am I going on court? I'm playing Annie Murray, one of the best players in the world. I have no chance at all. But I really don't know what he was doing. But the first two sets, he just plays exactly to my forehand every single time, and that was the only side I could move to. And I won the first two sets. I'm like, I'm gonna win this thing. But then, of course, Andy wouldn't be Andy if he starts to to think about what he's doing. And from that moment, he started to play everything on my back end. And I think it was six love, six to one, four love down. And and somehow it went to an epic match of four all. But then he destroyed me for six four. But um, I don't know what happened in that match. Uh, he should have beat me one, one, and one. In the <laughs> but uh, I, I love Andy. I think he's one of the greatest guys on tour we have. And uh, uh, I wish uh, uh, he he just would have destroyed me there because actually that match still, if although I was injured, that really hurt my my confidence for a long time. Oh really? Oh wow! Yeah. I was going to say it shouldn't have. He, you were the only person to take sets off him until he met Rafa and got knocked out. So you were the only person yeah. to take a set off him. Two. Yeah, but uh, the 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 tournament before, um, I I lost uh, to Benetton in the semis finals of uh, Winston Salem with uh, two match points, I think. Wow. And then this match came. And then I went to, I think it was Asia, and uh, I played uh, in Shanghai. And I was 6 love 4 one double break up against Nishikori and lost that match as well. So those three matches in a row kind of, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, hurt me for a while. And, and I really had to recover from that. Well, it's certainly tough to take. Yeah, well, let's go to a more positive note then. You go back to the U.S. Open in 2018, and in the first, oh, in the first round, sorry, you do the same to Mackenzie McDonald. You're two sets down, and then you come back to win in five. Now, this is incredible performance. Yeah, can you take us through what you were going through two sets down there? Yeah, that was a, that was a crazy day with uh, weather-wise. It was so hot, so humid, and um, I remember... And I had this once actually before in my career in Australia against Roddick, but now I had it against uh, Mackenzie as well, is that at 4-3 down in the first set, I'm walking a little bit to my coach and I'm telling him I'm done. I, I, I just, 
I'm, I'm done. I, I'm so tired. I, I'm totally drained. I have no energy. I don't know what to do. And he, of course, was like, no, come on. It's just in your head and blah, 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 blah all these things. And I have to say, Mackenzie just was playing so good, so fast, and he has great footwork. Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 I lost the first set. I lost the second set. Um, but during the second set, I, I, I was eating, I was drinking, and, and I started to feel a little bit better. And although he was still the better player, I started to get into the match. And the, the funny thing was, uh, in the third set, I kind of felt actually good again. I break him, and from that moment, I feel like I'm growing, growing, growing. And I look at the opponent, and I see a guy who's like, oh, I can't play. <laughs> and he got actually cramps. Oh, and, no. uh, so from that moment, I just felt invincible, and, uh, and I started to play well. He started to just go for it. Um, and the only thing that was tough was then the, the fifth set, because I won the third with good tennis. The fourth, he kind of gave it to me. But then you, you, you feel like, okay, this can, you know, he, he might be ready again. So I was like, okay, how am I, how am I going to attack this? You know, I'm, am I going to play the same or am I going to do a little bit more? Um, but in the end, I just, yeah, I, I got into a flow and I didn't think anymore and I just won the match. So that was great. Yeah, incredible. Well done for that. I guess momentum is important when you get it. You keep, you've got to ride it for sure. Unfortunately, <laughs> for sure. we're actually running out on the podcast. We've only got like four minutes left. We could have maybe three podcasts with you, Robin. But <laughs> well, we've got a few short um, questions for you anyway, just like quick fire sure. ones, really. But one of them is a bit longer, this one. So there's a few young players coming through. What do you think of the future of tennis? Um, uh, I think the future in tennis will be great. We will have big stars again. You will you already see uh, the Shapoval of the Tsitsi Pass. Even Dominic Team I still consider you know one of the younger guys. They will they will really entertain people and they will they will uh, be really nice to watch. What I do miss in tennis, but it has nothing to do with the guys. That has more to do with the surface. Is that everything in the last well kind of fifteen years. Um, got to a point where it's just slow mm. and I think we should have a little bit more faster courts I think at Wimbledon the grass court should be much faster uh, so the certain volley guys can come back the, you know and they can nowadays I feel more comfortable playing certain volley on clay than on grass wow. I mean that's, that shouldn't happen and I, I think f- uh, for tennis that would be a good thing as well because tennis is a sport of variety and not just hitting the ball as fast as you can uh, and, and that's it. And, and I feel like that happened a little bit in tennis. And uh, it's not bad, um, but it's, it, it can be better, I think. I think that's a really good point you make, actually. And no one's raised that before. So, yeah, yeah it's interesting. Sure. Um, and just another one, really, is do you have a favorite player to watch on tour? Um, well, we, we talked about one, which is Andy. I always really, really like to watch him. Um, so I... I I'm rooting for him to to come back. Uh, it's one of the players that I also send a private message to 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 offer any help I can. I know he has the best doctors, he has the <laughs> best, but you feel like yeah, you, you really want him to come back. Yeah. Uh, and 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 now, well, I have to go back a little bit in time. And for me, it was always David Nalbanian and uh, Marat Safin. Uh, those yeah. guys were just amazing. Um, um, nowadays. Um, yeah, you have some great players, but I, I can't tell you just one straight away, which I which you, I would take. You beat Marat Safin as well. Uh, very, very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Too <laughs> humble. Match, yeah, no, he had a match point and uh, he didn't take it. And, and, and then I said, okay, you already beat me once, not twice. <laughs> <laughs> well, what a good way to end it we've got less than a minute so thank you so much Robin for coming on it's been a pleasure having and listening to all your stories uh, I wish you the best in the future and hopefully we can see you back on court very soon thanks a lot and good luck with uh, the other podcasts guys thanks very much thanks, man. cheers okay. take care cheers.